<clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started with our class, uh, beginning with a word of prayer. If you'll bow with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come entering your presence with thanksgiving, glad to be here, glad to, to, to know that uh, you have blessed us so richly, and we thank you deeply for this opportunity to, to come and gather together and uh, just in, in unison give you the praise and the honor and, and glory for uh, all of those great and wonderful things that you do through us. Uh, we know, Heavenly Father, that many of those things uh, just test us and try us and, and uh, are designed to, to move us forward. And uh, we, we, we thank you for them. We thank you for the challenges. We thank you for uh, just all of the, uh, the wonderful ways that you uh, work in us in, in the minute details through one another, uh, through just uh, uh, the influence of those of like uh, precious faith uh, to move us uh, into spiritual maturity. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you continue to bless us as we continue to walk in your paths. Forgive us when we, <clears throat> when we stray from those paths and strengthen us and, and encourage us so that we can get up uh, from those, those times of trial and uh, move forward to, and be better for it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your, your son who went to a cross, who died that uh, cruel and uh, difficult death to open up that doorway of salvation for us so that we can have our sins forgiven so that we can live a life uh, in, in abundance uh, and fullness here, so that we can have that uh, spiritual uh, culmination of all things in that home in heaven with you. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this, this body that gathers here, the mutual edification that we receive, the, the uh, strengthening, uh, the encouragement, the love, and just uh, the, uh, the summation of all of our efforts together, making us stronger than we could ever be individually. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that <clears throat> you continue to bless us uh, as a body of believers, to give us uh, opportunities, and to help us uh, overcome uh, the unique challenges of, uh, of where we are and where we live and, and just uh, the things that we uh, have been made stewards of. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with those of our number who are going through difficulties, who are having trials and uh, doing and, and engaged in those things that uh, will will stress them, will uh, threaten uh, their uh, threaten their uh, outlook uh, of uh, being positive and uh, wanting to to mature in their faith. Uh, give us an opportunity to to minister to them and strengthen them. Heavenly Father, we pray all these things in Your Son's most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, hopefully you have week five in front of you. We're going to go ahead and start uh, it. Um, and uh, you'll have homework, uh, but we're going to go ahead and go through the introduction just this morning. Uh, you'll have three weeks, or excuse me, three days of a, a homework this upcoming week, uh, and then uh, the next week you'll have the additional uh, three days uh, of homework like we, we, we normally do. Uh, and this uh, particular section is all about uh, disappointments, trials, difficulties, uh, and how we can uh, overcome them. Uh, and just so we can kind of see how this sort of fits the overall program. Remember, we're talking about uh, spiritual revival. Uh, have you ever had one of those times in your life where, where things just, uh, you, you know, you finally came to this conclusion where, you know, things need to change uh, and the, your, your perspective changes and the road opens up and, and you're seeing things clearly and uh, you're, you're zealous and you want to move forward uh, and you're kind of on that mountaintop experience, right? Uh, and then what happens? There's a letdown, right? There's a, there's a, there's a letdown. You, you know, we, the, every, every step you take from the top of the mountain is a step down, right? Uh, and, uh, that's what a lot of people experience. Uh, you know, being uh, there on that, uh, high and seeing things clearly, uh, is, um, has its own unique difficulties. Uh, having a spiritual success uh, has its unique difficulties. So we're talking about spiritual revival. We're talking about, uh, you, you know, doing those things that uh, truly get us back uh, uh, to not just understanding what God, God's will for us is, but changing our perspective, uh, moving us forward, helping us grow and, and, and mature uh, and uh, be able to, you know, kind of better navigate uh, that sort of up and down nature 
uh, of uh, life so that eventually, you know, uh, we can reach this point where, at least in our perspective, uh, there are fewer ups and downs. Uh, where we are not always, um, you know, we, we may be going up and down, but as far as our spirituality goes, we're not tossed and turned. Uh, we, we don't waver. Uh, as far as our spiritual life goes, uh, we are standing on, the, you know, the rock, uh, and that rock does not um, move. Uh, so, you know, we began with the concept uh, of revival. Uh, we brought it down to the level where we are examining ourselves, uh, where we are looking at our talents, where we are offering uh, the whole of who we are uh, to uh, as a sacrifice after we have counted uh, the, the cost. Uh, and now we've reached this point where after doing all of that, um, what happens when things don't exactly go the way that we thought they would go? Uh, what happens when things aren't exactly the, the way that they, they seem? And, you know, people in general are real good uh, at uh, doing what, uh, what I like to call, it's a term I le- learned a while ago, um, but it's uh, self-talk. Uh, you, you know, anybody know what self-talk is? It's where you talk to yourself. Yeah, it's pretty, self, it's pretty self-explanatory. But you talk to yourself and you tell yourself that certain things will be the case, um, that certain things are going uh, to happen. Uh, and in many ways, you, you kind of, uh, when it gets out of control, you, you set yourself up for, you know, disappointment and, and failure uh, because your self-talking is built upon perhaps things that you can't control. Uh, sometimes husbands and wives do this. Uh, and we've mentioned this, you know, before, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, husband has a hard day at work and, and, uh, he's done with the day and he's thinking, man, I'm going to go home and I'm going to, you know, prop my feet up and my wife will be there and supper will already be done. And, you know, she's while I'm sitting in my chair and uh, she's going to come and give me the dinner. And while I eat, she's going to massage my feet. Okay. You know, I mean, that maybe that's not your vision, but you know, you talk that kind of idea up only to get home to be handed a list of, hey, the grass needs cut. Uh, grass needs cut, and by the way, one of the shutters has fallen off the back of the house. If you could fix that, because this is, the, and it's just this big long barrage of things, and in your mind, all of a sudden, all of those boxes that you've already checked off as being reality, they're getting unchecked. And as each one gets kind of unchecked in your mind, you just kind of get more disappointed and perhaps more angry, and perhaps, you know, more discouraged. Uh, well, we can do that kind of thing spiritually, too. You know, when we devote ourselves uh, to an idea, when we give ourselves completely to God, when we go to God in, in prayer, uh, and we ask Him for, you know, help and, and assistance, uh, what happens when all we really experience, and I don't want to say that it's the reality, but from our perspective, all that we really see is, this silence that doesn't explain anything. You know, okay, well, God, I asked you for this. You know, how come I don't have an, you know, how come there's no answer here? And how come, you know, and then we begin to get kind of disappointed and and distracted. Um, So that's kind of what the lesson is about. Uh, That period of time when, you know, we're moving along good and we're we're starting to engage in that spiritual revival. And then uh, all of a sudden things come along that perhaps were unexpected. Uh, or are disappointing uh, to us, disappointing to us. Uh, so the lesson begins by asking the question, uh, have you ever been disappointed? Uh, and then uh, where do you go and what <clears throat> uh, do you do uh, when you are uh, disappointed? When you are disappointed. Now, remember here, we're, we're framing this in, in a spiritual you know, framework, right? Uh, framing this kind of with the spiritual things. I mean, you may suffer disappointments in certain arenas, but they really don't have too much to do um, with your spirituality. But there are things that, in a very worldly way, we are disappointed with, uh, but they too become discouragements <clears throat> in a spiritual uh, way. All right, so have we suffered disappointment, and, and where do we go, uh, and what do we do when we are disappointment, disappointed? Well, maybe we should talk first about what is disappointment? What does it mean to be disappointed? Okay, unfulfilled dreams. Anything else? Yeah, 
Okay. <clears throat> okay, so unfulfilled dreams, and let's call that um, unfulfilled expectations. Okay, we have an expectation, and that, you know, it's not that there wasn't distance in the expectation, but it's not exactly what we thought it was going to be. All right, so unfulfilled dreams, unfulfilled expectations. What else? Disappointment. How's disappointment different from, say, discontentment? Right. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of speaks to where we go. Sometimes we don't go anywhere. When you're disappointed, what do you do? How do you deal with that disappointment? Well, do you like the, the pill bug? Everybody knows the pill bugs, right? You know, when you touch them, they kind of roll up in a ball. Uh, you know, the roly-polies is what we call them, you know, but, um, you know, is that what we do? We just kind of roll up, shut the door, you know, put the blackout curtains up and uh, just pretend like, you know, the world doesn't exist because it's a miserable place and we'd rather not be part of it. You know, is that what we do? Uh, sometimes? Yeah. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> there are some who would disagree with that. Right. That's okay. I mean, uh, to kind of sum it up in, in a couple of words, you just kind of push through it. You maintain that self-control and you push through uh, in, in a scenario like that because, well, there's a greater good. I mean, you, you need the job. You know, so <laughs> at the end of the road, there, you know, there's some light. Okay. Uh, so disappointed, what do we do? Where do we go? Well, those are hopefully questions that we're going to answer throughout uh, the entire lesson. Uh, and it's a, it's a great lesson. Uh, and the thing that I love best about the lesson, and this is kind of a spoiler in it, but the thing that I love best about this lesson is, is that hopefully by the end of it, uh, it gets us to thinking that uh, about this question. Are disappointments a bad thing? 
No, they're really not. Um, disappointments are actually opportunities. Uh, they're, they're actually opportunities. Uh, and if we have the right mindset, uh, if we have the, the, the mind um, that, number one, says that well, God's the one that's in control. And while I might be disappointed, it's better that I'm disappointed than he's disappointed. Uh, and, um, you know, they, there are a lot of things like that that we're going to talk about uh, as part of this uh, lesson. I, I do want to um, go ahead and have Glenn, um, if you're queued up, he's going to play a clip. Uh, we're, we're, I think everybody's been here. Uh, we're kind of using the, the, the Woodlawn movie uh, to sort of outline our lessons. Uh, of course, the Bible is our guide and uh, all of our, you, you know, scripture and truth comes from it. Uh, but we're using the, the Woodlawn movie uh, and the revival that they're calling for in that movie to kind of uh, be the springboard and the outline for uh, our lesson. So we're going to go ahead and view just a few moments of the clip from uh, lesson, um, uh, it says five, um, and this is our fifth uh, booklet. So I'm uh, going to let Glenn play that. Well, here it comes. Coach, so glad you could join us. I believe you know everybody here. Uh, this is Brenda Halley, lawyer from Montgomery. Ma'am, why don't you take a seat and let's get started. Go right ahead. Did you have an evangelist of some sort speak to the team this year and last? Yes. Was this activity school sponsored? Was it required? Well, it just sort of happened. Uh, it wasn't required, at least not the way that I saw. Last year, did you recite the Lord's Prayer before and after each game? Yes, we did. Did you dismiss players because they didn't want to be a part of this? Yes, he did. That is an outright lie. Your son quit. Coach, are you aware of the U.S. Supreme Court ruling on this issue because you're in clear violation of it? And whether you like it or not, you are breaking the law. See, I think this has more to do with the color of my tailback than God. I want you to stop all religious activities until this board has taken this matter under full review. You mean on school property? I you mean about all it. activities. Otherwise, you will be removed as coach from Woodlawn High School. Some people are surprised to discover that becoming a Christian doesn't put an end to adversity and disappointment. Rather, it invites it. I played college basketball. Well, played may be a stretch of the imagination, but I was on a college basketball team, and the coach explained it this way. He said, Stone, I got you on the team so that after the game is over, the cheerleaders have someone to hug that isn't all sweaty. So I was in a lot of games, but I noticed I never was in any games when it was at really a critical moment. Now, I practiced. I prepared the team for the action. Uh, I was right in the thick of it. If we lost, my heart ached. If we won, I celebrated. But you know what? A close game, whenever you would lose, I mean, you could always think of one play that you wish there was one thing that would have gone differently. And that's kind of how it is when it comes to sports. You always think of one more thing. But you know what? There's always another game the next week. And you can't change the outcome once the buzzer sounds. Now, in reality, in real life, that's not the case. Because we face disappointment and adversity. And suffering is much harder to deal with. And for many, coming into a relationship with Jesus, it, it seems to be an instant relief for that suffering. I mean, you feel intimacy with God. You're on a spiritual high. You're on top of the world. But life up there is kind of short-lived. There's something quite interesting when you study the Gospels in the New Testament. You know, we don't really have any biblical record of Jesus encountering opposition in his adult life until after he was baptized. Baptism is an invitation for God to be beside you through suffering, not exempt from it. But here's the thing, baptism will not make you invincible. In fact, what happens is, anytime you make any spiritual commitment to Christ, you awaken the power of darkness. And Satan has no need to bother you or, or come after you as long as you're living for him. He's thinking, why well, mess with whatever it is that's working? But the Bible says that he's the prince of this world, and if God allows it, Satan can alter or affect your health and your wealth or your circumstances. 
So realize that when you take a stand for Jesus, it may be followed with some related or unrelated consequences. Your company may downsize you. Your health may fail. Your friends may desert you. Jesus never promised exemption from adversity, but what he did promise was that you would never be alone. You'd have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, that he would walk beside you, even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And what is painful today will produce character tomorrow. As is often the case, when it rains, it pours. And sometimes, rather than things getting better, sometimes they get worse. Legs hurt. What? I can play. Who did this to you? Twenty students and nobody saw a thing. I find that hard to believe. Look, if the if the director of the school board or any agents or police want to ask you any questions, just direct them to me. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you, coach. I'm sorry. It's not your fault, Tandy. Yes, it is. Back in the 1980s, Dave Dravecki was a star pitcher for the San Francisco Giants until he was diagnosed with cancer. In his left arm, his pitching arm, was actually amputated along with a part of his shoulder. Now, this Christian man never wallowed in self-pity. He, he faced it incredibly well. A couple years after the surgery, I, I had the privilege of actually getting to speak on the same program with Dave. And I asked him, I said, how have you kept such a positive spirit and positive attitude? He said, well, God has taught me something the last couple of years. He said, God taught me that if you've ever been on a mountaintop, you won't find any lush vegetation there. He said, the lush vegetation is always down in the valley. He said, you know why? He said, it's because that's where the soil is the richest. And that's where the most growth takes place. He said, what I've found is that through this valley, God has been helping me to grow and to deepen. When Dave Dravecki was knocked down, he got back up. He allowed the setbacks and the adversity to deepen him. So the question becomes, how do you deal with disappointment? Well, I hope that you're involved in some type of a small group or some group of Christian friends that can lift your spirits. And hopefully the people who are, are watching this with you, maybe they have your back and, and they can give you encouragement but they can also speak truth into your life. Because sometimes you don't need a pat on the back. Sometimes you need a kick in the pants. You need to end the pity party and just kind of get on with life. Because in this life, we all need all the help we can get. The enemy will never cease in his efforts to try to break our spirits and destroy our resolve.
let's go ahead and look at the, the rest of the sheet. Uh, we're going to read uh, John chapter 16. We're going to begin at verse 16 and we're going to read down through 33. I'll, I'll just read it for us. It says, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while and you will see me uh, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to another, what is that that he says uh, to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, uh, a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. And Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. And he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? And what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. And when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have <clears throat> sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. In the day, you will be asking nothing. Uh, in that day, you will be asking nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whether you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it. Or whatever you ask in the Father, uh, ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will <clears throat> ask in my name, and I do not uh, say to you that I will ask the Father uh, on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved him, and he believed that, uh, and have believed that I, I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father." His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone. For the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. All right, uh, so a little section there about uh, some of the disappointments, discouragements, trials, tribulations, and persecutions. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the questions that are uh, left here in the introduction. What overall perspective was Jesus conveying to his disciples uh, about suffering? Uh, to kind of word it another way, what was he trying to get them to see uh, about this whole you are going to suffer tribulation uh, scenario? What was he trying to get the, what was the lesson he's teaching? Yeah, well, number one, they were going to have disappointments, right? They were going to have disappointments. What else? Yeah, but their disappointment, he says, uh, sorrow. You, you know, your, your sorrow or the sorrow that emanates from these disappointments, these discouragements, these, these trials, uh, is going to be, is going to be turned, uh, into joy. Now, now let's think for just a minute. When he's talking about the disappointment of these disciples, see, we know the rest of the story, don't we? Okay. So, so when he says disappointments to them, what form did that take later on? Yeah, most of them ended up dying, right? Uh, most of them ended up pretty much going from place to place and not really having a, you know, a, a, a place to, to rest their heads. I mean, Paul uh, was constantly on missionary journeys. Ex not, you know, people tried to execute him, stone him, uh, you know, shipwrecked, um, put into prisons, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, being heard in the sense that they didn't understand, right? You know, I mean, they heard the message, and unfortunately, not fully grasping the message, uh, they often had violent reactions. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, acts of violence, mobs, riots, people dragging, you know, Paul and, and up uh, off to prisons and beating them and, you know, surrounding them and picking up stones. Uh, trying to, you know, kill them. I mean, if, if that, if that happens in our world today, it, it just, you know, we're shocked by it. Uh, but that's what he was talking about. Uh, th- that's kind of the rest of the story, these Paul Harvey's words, uh, for, you know, these disappointments, uh, for these guys. Um, but he tells them, there's a big but here. You know, that sorrow that you're going to have, that disappointment, uh, and of course, um, to add kind of nuance to, to what you know, you know, Beth said, uh, it, it's just we're just let down when something seems so obvious to us, and others can't see it. Um, that it, it just it can be very, very discouraging, you know, for us. You know, why do I keep speaking these things, and why did do people continue to not, you know, receive it for the truth that it is? Why, why can't they see? You know, when we get into that whole why, 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 and we want to know why, we want to know the motives, we want to know, you know, all of that about other people's scenarios, um, and in reality, we, we really can't control that type of thing, can we? You know, um, so he's trying to get them to see that, yeah, okay, you will have disappointments, and we know they were in some pretty horrible situations. Um, they were in some pretty horrible situations, but you know, their sorrow would become uh, joy. Now, let me ask you this. What joy? What is he talking about? What's that? Well, he rose from the dead. Yeah. And there, what's, the, what's the logical follow-on from that, Jeannie? He rose from the dead, from the dead, therefore what? Hey, therefore we will too, right? So, I mean, if you have persecution for the rest of your life and they end up uh, in this world taking your life, you will rise again. Okay, you will rise again. All right. But is there a part of that joy that's now? Was there a part of that joy that was now for them? Okay, yeah, the joy that knowing even if they are taking your life, that he's with you even then. He's with you like Joseph. You know, he's with you in the, in the prison. He's with you in the pit. He's with you every step of the way. Uh, and he has your back and he, and he knows best. It, it may look bleak to you at times and you may wonder what in the world is going on, uh, but God has your back. Uh, and uh, he, he's going to, because he has higher purposes, lead you, you know, to understand hopefully those, you know, higher purposes uh, and, and the meaning of it all. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's, if you didn't hear Carrie, she said, uh, you know, we have each other. Uh, we have each other, and, uh, you know, we are, as we talked about way back at the beginning of the lesson, uh, we are a team, uh, and, and we are there, you know, for one another, should be there for one another, uh, and that plays a lot um, in, in this. I mean, if you were truly going alone and alone in this world, you know, how comforting is that? Well, that's not very comforting, is it? You know, nobody has my back. There's nobody I can run to. There's no, there's no place to go. There's, there's no one, no shoulder to cry on, so to speak. Nobody, even, even when things are going well, there, there's nobody to rejoice with. You know, hey, let's, we're going to celebrate. There's nobody there. Um, you know, we need people uh, to rejoice with. We need people to sorrow uh, with. Uh, and, and since Carrie brought it up, there's a fairly big section in your homework uh, that talks about this. You, you are... Um, going to be answering questions not simply for yourself and your personal experience, uh, but you're also going to be answering them ab- about your 
Christian family. Um, and, and at one point, you're, you're actually going to be kind of rating yourself and rating uh, the church on how well we do uh, on certain things. Uh, and it's mainly for your benefit, uh, just to kind of take stock. Uh, but it's important. Uh, it's important to, you know, evaluate those things. I mean, are you, are you the kind of person who is the shoulder to cry on? Uh, do you have someone to go to? Uh, you know, so on and so forth. But let's go ahead with the questions. What kind of distresses did Jesus say they will uh, experience? Well, we've kind of hit that. He calls them sorrow, tells them they're going to be, uh, you know, scattered. Uh, and like I said, we, we kind of know the rest of, you know, their story. Uh, and it, it, um, it can be very, very harsh, you know, for them. Um, what did, deci- what uh, did the disciples' failures reveal uh, about uh, their faith? That's the first bell? Okay. Uh, what did the disciples' failures uh, reveal uh, about their faith? What failure is there here? Well, for one thing, they didn't quite understand, right? They didn't quite understand. Um, and we know that when he tells them they're going to scatter, um, that they're going to scatter. We know that happens. Um, but, you know, what, what does that teach them? What does that teach them about their faith? Yeah, I mean, you can put you know, yourself in that scenario. When these types of things come up, it, it uh, has this refining effect, um, which begins with, okay, what's the raw material of your faith? You know, uh, and, and for, uh, it doesn't matter what other people have, but, you know, it'll let you know, okay, well, what's the stuff you're made of, you know, uh, and uh, how much refining has to take place, uh, you know, how, how hot does that fire have to be stoked, how much skimming has to be, you know, done uh, to get rid of uh, the impurities uh, and, and the defilement from other things, um, so yeah, you know, the tests, uh, they're designed to do that, okay, uh, what did God use how did God use their failure to, to deepen, you know, their faith? Uh, and then what is the biggest takeaway from the passage about uh, the purpose uh, of pain uh, in faith? Um, let's just kind of focus on the last one. You know, wh- what do we think of pain? Pain. Yeah, it's a discomfort. Hmm? Heartache. Beth? Yeah, it can help you grow if you let it. You know, um, I've mentioned it before, but I had this wonderful book, one of my favorite books. It's called Pain, the Gift That Nobody Wants. Uh, and um, it, it, uh, it goes through and it, it talks about people who uh, physically ha- have illnesses or diseases where they cannot feel pain. Um, they, they can't feel pain. And, and, it, and it just how... Kind of miserable and challenged they are because they are unable to feel pain and how dangerous life is for them because they cannot feel uh, pain. You know, pain is indeed a gift uh, from God. Uh, and um, it, it truly is the gift that, you know, we sometimes question, sometimes causes doubts, sometimes makes us think, huh, you, you know, is there really a God who would give me such pain? Um, but uh, if we have that proper perspective, uh, I think we see it for what it is. Um, it, it is that refiner's fire. Uh, it, it is that um, work of God in our life and in our hearts uh, to do just amazing and, and astounding uh, things, um, which are often difficult to see when we're in the midst of the trial. Um, you know, but, um, you know, I, I, they are certainly there. But that's the second bell. So the notes are yours. You can go ahead and start... Uh, uh, the first three days of this week, uh, go through it, uh, and um, uh, hopefully you, uh, hopefully you'll be encouraged by it. But I appreciate everybody's input. Thank you. If you would, you can turn in your Bibles to the Book of Colossians, chapter one. Colossians, chapter one. We are continuing our series, uh, the Woodlawn series, and we are continuing that kind of series within the series about leaving a legacy. Uh, it's fitting. My mom's here, uh, and I guess uh, that in many ways I am her legacy, and uh, and um, hopefully she's proud of me uh, and uh, the things that we do. And uh, she feels uh, <laughs> that all of her work, and believe me, she had to do a lot of work, uh, was not in vain. 
Um, so what I don't want to happen, every time my mom comes uh, and she's here, um, people come up to me afterward, there we go. People come up to me afterward and they say things like, um, well, your mom doesn't look old enough to have a son like you. And I don't really know how to take that. Uh, I'm not really sure <laughs> how, whether I should be flattered or, you know, happy for her because she looks good. Uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure how that is. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's fitting. Uh, we are talking about legacy. What kind of legacy do you leave? The fundamental things of life, the important things of life are really what we're talking about. Do you live a life of faith? Are you living a life that is love? And this morning we're talking about living a life that is full of hope. And this is perhaps the one that we think of most when we think of this concept of leaving a legacy, probably because of the statement that is made in in the scripture about how we ought to always have an answer for people when they come and they ask us about the hope that lies within us. People ought to see the hopefulness in our life. And and you know, you you ever think about that statement? Do you ever think about, okay, what is it that people are actually seeing? And why is it that hope is the one thing that seems to be picked out here as being identifiable and wanting people to question, what is it about you? I think it's because we live in a world that really doesn't offer much hope. I mean, we live in a world, and when I say that, I'm not talking about the physical existence here. I'm talking about that worldly system. We live in a worldly system that is dictated by that prince of the power of the air that is constantly trying to get men to not have hope, to not be loving, and to not have the faith that they should. Everybody remembers the Charles Schultz comic strip, Peanuts, right? There are a few of them I remember. I love cartoon strips. Grew up reading them. Couldn't wait for the Sunday papers. uh, Pull those out and and get them. And and some of them were actually in color, right? We had the funny pages. One of the ones I do remember was there one time Linus and, and Lucy are sitting on a couch. And they're watching TV. And Lucy just looks over at Linus, like she always does with most of the people around her. And in very gruff fashion, you can almost imagine, she says, I'm thirsty. Go get me a glass of water. And of course, Linus just looks at her and says, why would I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. And then Lucy looks back at him and says, On your 75th birthday, I'll bake you a cake. On your 75th birthday, I'll bake you a cake. Linus gets up, and as he's walking to the kitchen to get the glass of water, comic strip says, it's good to have something to look forward to. And how true it is. It's supposed to be funny in the comic strip, but it's good to have something to look forward to, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we should all be amen in that one. It's good. It's good to know that this life, that's many times full of trouble, many times full of trial, many times full of the things that, that we don't want to come to our lives because we live in this broken world and, and we operate in systems that, that are broken and that are constantly in this kind of state of, of decay. And we're reminded each and every day that we too, in this bodily form, are marching toyed toward our time of perishing. We are reminded constantly that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment, that we are like vapors, that we are like the swift ship on the sea, faster than a weaver's shuttle is, <clears throat> is our life. It's good to have something to look forward to and to know that there's something that awaits us that's better, better than anything that we could have here. In in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, John wrote this. He says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God, now listen to this, the man who does the will of God lives forever. Man, that's our something to look forward to. The man who does the will of God lives forever. Now you'll notice here, John gives the three basic rules of the world. The three basic operating principles of the world. When the world wakes up every day, it has these three goals in in mind. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. How can I fulfill them? But you see, the person who wants that something better, the person who wants that live forever type of thinking, that, that, that moment that turns it into eternity, they wake up saying, how can I serve my God? How can I promote the hope that comes only from God and only from knowing that future exists? How can I promote that today? Colossians 1, you're already there. Chapter 1, well, I'm telling you to turn there. I've neglected to turn there myself. But in Colossians, Paul, of course, is the writer. And he's going to talk about, he's going to talk about this idea. You know, these people in the first century, they were living in times kind of like ours. They would look around them and and they would see things that would not only draw from, draw away from their, their hope, but were not very hopeful. They were persecuted, not just by the Romans, but by the Jewish folks. They were being persecuted. Paul, in in his writing, and in many of his epistles, he talks about hope. But notice with me verse 27. We're actually going to begin at verse 24 and read down to it. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that has given, that was given to me for you to make a word of God, the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known the great, excuse me, to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And man, that ought to be the, the keystone for, for our life. There is hope, but that hope is only found in Jesus Christ. This morning, we want to talk about the legacy that he left us. But I want you to be thinking of this, too. Because Christ left us a legacy, but he didn't leave us this legacy of hope so that we would simply embrace it, kind of make it our own, and kind of keep it as our own. He leaves us this legacy so that we will further leave the legacy to others. It is something just like faith was when we talked about it, just like love was when we talked about it. Hope is a legacy that is, hope is something that should be a legacy that we pass on to generation after generation after generation. Three things we want to talk about this morning. What does Christ have to offer us? Number one, Christ is our hope of eternal life. Number two, Christ is our help in this life. And then number three, Christ is our haven of rest. He's our hope in eternal life. He is our help in this life. He is our haven of rest. So I'm giving all three of them to you up front. Of course, you already have them if you have the bulls, and you can just kind of write them in. But let's observe just a couple of things. Number one, Christ is our hope of eternal life. Some people look at this life and, and they don't see anything really, really positive. They look around and they say things like, well, you know, everybody has problems and everybody has sins and, you know, everybody has this and everybody has that. And they take this view of, of, the, of life that, that is just very, very negative. And it's not real difficult to do that, is it? Sometimes we'll allow influences to come into our life that 
just really lead us in, in, in wrong directions. And we are kind of torn at times. I'll, I'll tell you, this year has kind of been one of those years for me. It started off, you know, and, and I'm real interested in what's going on with that whole election process and those people and, you know, all of that. And, you know, I want to stand up and, and, and promote my, my faith and make sure that the people who are in there are, are wanting to promote, you, you know, faith. And, and that's a great thing. And I think everybody ought to want to do that. We, we want to maintain that, that heritage that was given to us from, you know, the beginning. But if you turn on every radio station and listen to all the talk radio and you get online and you look up all the stuff that everybody I'm telling you what, it is discouraging. At least to me it was. And I found myself not being very hopeful until one day I just changed the station. I just turned it. And I said, you know, kind of like Mike said on Wednesday, God's going to take care of it. God's will be done. All I need to do is serve. All I need to do is put my efforts in spiritually. Do the job that I'm supposed to be doing. See, that's how I'm going to make this world a better place. That's how I'm going to have that, that hope. People look at the world around them. They don't see much hope here. So they can't imagine this whole concept of hope in eternal life. I think there's a reason why that is. And the Bible spells it out pretty clearly for us. We begin in, in a paradise there in the beginning. God, in the beginning, created all things, right? And he put man in the garden, and he was in that perfect and harmonious relationship. And then we know what broke it all back then, right? We know that the serpent comes in with the same lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life, right? He comes in with that. Sin enters into the world, and then from there, we've just been kind of dealing with the fallout. We live in a broken and busted world. But you see, God has a plan. And we're told about that plan in, in, in many, many places. But John chapter 3 and verse 16 is one of those places where we're told about God's plan being fulfilled. Now, I do typically don't start there. Because see, John chapter 3 and verse 16 is really built upon the entirety of the Old Testament. It's concentrated in some places, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 53, where we're told about the vicarious suffering and the ministry in the life of Jesus Christ and how he would give himself so that others could prosper. He would become that sacrifice. All that Old Testament, the lamb of the Passover, the feasts, all of the shadows point to the substance which is John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? That whosoever should what? Believe in him. Faith is important. And when we have faith, and when we promote that faith, and we act in, in love, the two other things that we've talked about, it produces in our hearts and it produces in our lives this hope. This confident expectation not just some kind of loosely offered wish it's funny I, I like word studies and I went back and I, I started looking up the etymology up for the word hope in English and what I found out was that man there's a whole lot there but most of the time they end up saying things like well it's unsure it's unsure but there are a couple of things of, of which we are sure about the word hope. It emanates from the same root from which we get the word hop. Hop. The, the word that we use for like a small jump. And the word centuries ago had kind of built into it this ecstatic jumping for joy over a confident desire. And I thought, man, that's the perfect picture of hope in the Bible. Man, is our life each and every day a confident jumping for joy because we know there's an eternity? An eternity that is built upon the fact that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? Now make no mistake about it, we didn't deserve that, right? Paul tells us in the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of 
sin or death, right? See, if we're getting what we deserve, then that's what we get. It's like going to a job. When you go to a job, you work the work. At the end of the week, you get your wages, right? Well, all of our works here added up in totality, they get us nothing more than that death. Christ came into the world to make that not so. Paul over in the book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse 12 says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up. One who will arise to rule over the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. Our hope is in Christ. But see, Christ went to a cross and he died, made that sacrifice for our sins. And the Bible tells us he ascended up to heavenly places. He sat down at the right hand of God where he ever lives to make intercession for us because one day we are going there. Like he told his disciples, I'm going away, but I'm going to return. And where I go, you can come and be with me there. There is hope in Christ. I think Ernest Hemingway, and most of us, even if you've never read any Hemingway, if you live in Florida, you're, you're familiar with Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway once kind of summed up the worldview sort of like this. He said, life is just a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. There is no remedy for anything in life. Man's destiny in the universe is like a colony of ants on a burning log. Hemingway ended up taking his own life. And if that's your outlook, it's no wonder. It's no wonder. Now you compare that to so many other people who sought answers to the same questions that he asked and yet found very, very different responses from God. Perhaps because they were listening. Perhaps because they were more attuned. Late in life, early in life. Sought him, found him, realized that there is a hope and there is purpose. And there is meaning to this life. I have a book in my office. It's called, I believe it's called, I have to double check it, The Deep Journey of Grace. And it's a story told by the Church of Christ minister about a prison visitation that he did for several years. And there was one particular prisoner that he would go in and he would talk to all the time. Talk to him about his past. Talk to him about what led him to this point. Talk to him about the crimes that that he had committed. Talk to him about what he was going to do. Where his hope was. That Christ could offer him hope. And that though he lived his life in a horrible way here, there could be something better for him. Now, most of us know that prisoner by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer. who was baptized and became a Christian while he was in prison. He's not much different than a king by the name of Ahab, who had done more in Israel to sin than any other king before him, who just before he died, though he had burnt his own children in the belly of an iron beast, to a god by the name of Moloch that was nothing more than a figment of somebody's imagination. We're told was given forgiveness by God when he repented. See, Christ Christ came to this world. God sent his son so that you can have forgiveness, so that you can have hope. So it doesn't matter how you've lived your life prior to this moment. Christ came to seek and save that which is lost. Bad things are going to happen. Trouble is going to come. Will you choose him to help you overcome and give you that hope? Point number two, Christ is our help in life. 
Christ is our help in life. Kind of reminds me of the, the old joke that the teenage, teenage girl went to her father and she was talking to him very enthusiastically about her new boyfriend. Her new boyfriend. And after she was done and the father was, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. First question he asked was, does this boyfriend make any money? To which the teenage daughter replied, I mean, that's funny, you guys are all alike. He asked the same thing. See, that was supposed to be funny. I guess not. Yeah, I'm going to quit telling jokes. <laughs> it's not about money. Hope is not built upon a bank account. Hope is not built with gold bricks or stacks of cash. Hope in life does not always come in the, in the form of a bank account. The greatest problems that we have in life typically can't be remedied by simply writing out a check. See, Christ provides for us this help that sometimes seems almost undefinable to us when we run into those difficult times, when things happen that we very simply don't expect. Christ is our help in this life. Now, we have throughout the Bible a description of how that help comes. And it's given in numerous places and at numerous times to to numerous people. You can go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and sort of walk your way forward. And we typically sum up what God does in a couple of ways. Number one, we have those ways that God intervened in times past, which are not present in our day and age, which are called miracles. People were sick. Paul, Peter, one of the disciples, Christ himself, would come along and lay hands on them and, you know, boom, they they, they were healed. God simply does not operate. Those things were done so that men might believe, according to John, or according to Christ as he speaks and recorded by John. Those things were done so that they might believe in that time. And they were written. And once they were written, once the word was established and the truth given to all men, those things were done away with. But you see, God still works. We're told about God's providence. And perhaps one of the best examples that we have of this goes all the way back in the Old Testament. And it's in the life of a woman by the name of Esther who marries a king and is in a position to help save her people. She's a Jew. She's married to a king who is not a Jew. And laws have been enacted that are going to literally slaughter her people. And her cousin, a guy by the name of Mordecai, comes to her, sends message for her, calls her out, and tells her, you have to go before the king. You have to make the plea on behalf of your people. And she seems somewhat hesitant. And then Mordecai gets very real with her and tells her, Look, if you don't do this, God will rise up and he will save his people by any means. But he has placed you here, and we all know the words, don't we? For such a time as this. See, that's God's providential care. We see it also in the New Testament, in places like Matthew chapter 6. Oh, it all ends with another very familiar phrase, doesn't it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? His righteousness and all These things will be added unto you. What things? Well, the previous context tells us that they were worried about many things. The basics, the essentials of life, what they're going to eat and how they're going to be taken care of and where they're going to live. And he tells them, look, those things will be taken care of. God's going to take care of you. We have in other places statements made by this, but like this by Christ. Ask. And you what? Shall receive. Knock and what? The door will be open to you. Seek and ye shall find. Right? How do you think that's going to happen? How do you think that's going to happen? What happens in many ways, doesn't it? God's providence is a wonderful thing. Sometimes he sends people to us. Sometimes he sends circumstances to us. Sometimes it seems like a smack in the face to wake us up. Sometimes it's a subtle nudging. Sometimes it takes the form of a friend coming up to us and saying, brother, I'm here for you. 
Sometimes it's that same brother coming up to us and said, brother, you're in sin and you need to make it right. See, help doesn't always mean, you know, oh, we're going to you know, help me feel good. It means help down that straight and narrow. Help understanding and practicing the, the truth. Doing the truth. Psalm 121, verses 1 through 3. I believe it's David that writes this. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. When we look to the Lord in this life, we can have that hope because he is our help. About this time last year, I found myself with two kids underestimating the time and the distance it would take to drive to Death Valley. We wanted to go and see the park. And we're in the middle of nowhere, going down this highway that says it's going to take us there. But at the further I drive, you know, there's this little thing on your dashboard. It's a needle that goes from F to E. When you're in the middle of nowhere, you want that thing to be closer to F than it is to E. Ours was getting closer and closer and cl And you know, the only thing I saw to fill my tank up with was sand. And the kids are in there and I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm not going to freak out because it's just going to make them nervous, make them upset. Here we are, nothing, no houses, no farms. I mean, there's literally nothing. There's a reason they call it Death Valley. So I start praying and I pray and I'm saying my prayers and I get off at an exit and there's one guy on a tractor sitting on the side of the road. And I go up and I talk to the guy, I say, hey, I'm really low on gas. Where can I find gas? And his first, answer, his first answer was very, very interesting. He said, well, you can go back there to that Air Force base you just passed. I didn't pass any Air Force base. It was all desert. And, he, and I said, I didn't see it. And he said, well, it's not that kind of Air Force base. I still don't know what that means. But, you know, I went on, went on. And, and he said, well, if you go down this road in about five miles, you'll find a town where you can get gas. Now, when he said this road, it wasn't the interstate that I was on. It was this dirt thing. But sure enough, five miles. We drifted into town and on fumes with the light just flashing at me frantically. Ended up at a gas station. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a firm believer that God answers prayers. And I look at that situation and whether God was in putting that guy there or giving me the right answer and not lying to me or playing a trick or oh, I don't know what. God be praised. And we can honor him in all that we do. Final thing. Christ is our haven of rest. Christ is our hope in eternal life. He is our help in this life. He is our haven of rest. What does that mean? Our haven of rest. Well, Matthew, I think, in chapter 11, records these words, and it gives us a good indication. Verses 28 through 29, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, I think this is something that transcends both this life and the next. That's why it's a separate point. You, you can have hope now. As a matter of fact, you have to hope, have hope now. Because hope in eternity, which is the ultimate fulfillment of it, disappears when that's fulfilled. That's why when Paul wrote things like, 
And now remains faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. Because see, love is a foundational principle. Faith will give way to sight. Hope will find itself fulfilled. So in this life, we can have that haven. Psalm 46 and verse 1. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 40 verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3. I patiently wait for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Did you notice the transition there? Starts out in the muck and the mire and he ends up with singing praises. You see, that's what being in Christ is all about. That hope in eternity, that help that we have now, and this haven of rest. I'll give you one more scripture. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It is said that Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato taught for 50, Aristotle for 40, and Jesus for only three. And yet I doubt very many of us today could write even a paragraph about the things that either one, Socrates or Aristotle or Plato, said. And yet even those who do not profess any faith at all use many of the sayings that Jesus uttered in the course of his life. Christ, while he was alive, never wrote any poetry, but guys like Dante and Milton wrote scores of them about him. He never wrote any kind of music but Haydn and Handel and Beethoven and Bach and Mendelssohn and many, many more. Even up to our contemporary time are still writing songs about him. Why? Because he is our hope. He is our purpose. He is our meaning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're living a life that just doesn't have a lot of hope and purpose. Isn't it time you come to Christ? Isn't it time you take what he's offering? Hear his word this morning. Believe, let it produce in you that faith, that strength of conviction, which will lead you to, to want to do things like change your perspective about sin and the ways of the world. In other words, repent. And then confess the name of Christ, be baptized for the remission of your sins, to be saved, as Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. So you can rise to walk in newness of life with meaning, with purpose. Now, I know it's easy to get distracted from that. It's easy to let the pathways of life kind of intervene and take you in other directions. Maybe that's where you are. But if you find yourself this morning having need to respond to the invitation, don't be fearful. Don't delay. Come before your brothers and sisters in Christ who are here to, to mourn with you, to weep with you, to rejoice with you, to strengthen you, to build you up. Respond as together we stand and sing.